Um, I, I'm Joel Collin, um, and I'm EPSRC Research Software Engineering Fellow at Queen's University in Belfast. So my talk is an analysis of software in UK academic repositories. Um, and really this came about um, when uh, I read one of Simon's tweets about REF, um, when I was researching on Twitter one morning, um, and just about the kind of state of the amount of um, outputs uh, in REF that are software. And it got me thinking about uh, how this, um, how academic repositories impact on this. Um, and whether software is actually kept there or not. So in terms of REF eligibility for software, um, there are strict open access guidelines for outputs, papers. Software is exempt from this, so non-textual outputs are exempt from REF um, in terms of open uh, open access. Um, these are the wrong slides, sorry. They're all out, sorry, I'll have to whiz through them then. So the REF submission guidance um, does state in its definition of software that has been made publicly available. So to be defined as uh, REF returnable, um, it's been made publicly available. There's no other statement about what that actually means. That's very, very vague. That could be Google Drive, for example. It must have a written description of the software and crucially how the software, including the source code, source code if applicable, can be accessed. So, we set about looking to see how much software is in institutional repositories in the UK. We want to see if there are other correlational variables to give us some insight into this. But overall, really, what can this tell us about software as first order outputs in the research process? So this has been accepted for the first half of this has been accepted for publication in BRJ Computer Science. So some definitions, which kind of sounds a bit kind of A-level debating student day, but really had to kind of try and refine this as I was going along. In terms of academic institution, we're going to talk about this. It's degree granting, third level education, what we think of as a university. And the institutional repository, because it varies quite a lot, is the open access storage in that second facility called commonly a RIS, Research Information System, or CRIS, or Institutional Repository. So, our method then. So, I was kind of quite lazy to start with, being part, ad, part academic. So, I thought, has somebody else done this work for me before they can analyze? And there was no full coverage source of software records in institutional repositories. Nobody has done this before. There's lots of partial ones, which I talk about in the paper quite a lot, but there was no overall synopsis of universities. So we set about doing it ourselves. For this, I needed a list of uh, UK academic institutional repository URLs. For that, I needed a list of UK academic uh, institutions and their URLs, which was way, way more difficult than it should have been. It spent a long time trying to get a list of UK universities. It should be fairly straightforward. And I had to go to Wikipedia. I, I tried to do this programmatically, so being not half my job as software engineer, so I was being lazy again, trying to do it programmatically. Um, very error prone. I read a lot about this in the paper in terms of using OAA PMH protocol to try and harvest data. Um, it was really error prone and, and inaccurate. So what we had to do was manually visit 182 repositories from 157 institutions. Therefore, a lot of institutions have more than one repository. Some have a paid for so uh, solution and also an open source. I thought this was quite a lot and quite laborious. Recently, I've done an international one with 5,000 repositories, which has been my summer. Um, we also used the core API um, to provide additional metadata, which we talk about, and we published this data set. There are two versions of it, then also all the links that we used. Um, so this is an example of what I'm talking about. This is Queen's. Um, so we use pure paid for solution by Elsevier. Um, you see, we've uh, gone to research outputs, selected software as the type, because there's a defined type of software, so we can do that. We get 36 results. That's what we did just for all every university in the UK. So we filtered these into three categories then. So it does not contain software. So software exists as a searchable item. It's listed as a thing in their defined vocabulary, but there are no records. Then contains software. So the same thing, software exists as a type, but has records. And then third, no direct software search capability. Software doesn't exist as a searchable term. It's not one of their defined vocabulary. So you cannot upload software as a thing. It's listed as other. Crucially, it doesn't mean there is no software in the repository. It means it's not listed. It's listed as other, typically, or as data. So our results, which are eye-watering. Um, so when we look at all the, all the repositories, uh, 63, nearly 64% can't contain software as a defined item type. 8.8% uh, um, have a, a type of uh, output called software, but don't contain anything. And 27.5% contain software. When we look at the institutions, then we get the same kind of breakdown, roughly 30, 60, 10. So around about 60% have no way of storing software as a thing. So if I'm a researcher and I want to upload my software, I can't call it software on that. So we looked at who actually has uh, software. This is a very busy slide, but I'm just showing us for distribution. So these are the 50 universities or institutions and repositories that have software as their as a type. And you see there's a massive skew over to one side. What we see here is the top ranked institute, Imperial, is responsible for a fifth of all software records and institutional repositories. 
I was talking to Jeremy Cohen about this and asked, you know, is this an, like an institutional, this cultural thing? Like, can, can you tell me a bit about it? And I said, no, I think it was actually one guy just sat and typed all stuff in. Just really wanted, thought this should be done and manually did it himself, which isn't really sustainable or re replicatable. Uh, Imperial has nearly 10 times the mean um, of the those that contain software, the amount of records, and the top five are responsible for more than half. So it's massively skewed in the handful of uh, institutional repositories. So we said we look at some additional um, variables. Uh, we look at the platform software, which is very telling. Metadata format, which I don't have time to go into, but I could spend probably 15 hours talking about this. Um, the, whether you're a member of the Russell Group or not, just because I thought you know, we, we can manually add this, and then whether there's an RSC group listed at the university. So in terms of the platform software, uh, top three solutions are account for about 90, roughly 90% 90 of um, the all institutional repositories. This is telling. ePrints is responsible for more than half, um, but does not contain software as a type in its default configuration. So we get an out-of-box solution. It does not contain software as a type. Pure, a paid-for solution, as I said, and DSpace open source, both contain software as a default configuration type. So if you get a brand new out-of-box solution, software is a type. But this leads to kind of one of the worrying things that I, that I find. When we look at, this is a proportional chart for each type of uh, repository software. Um, blue is contained software, orange does not contain software, and green, no software search. Pure should always have software as a searchable item. As we see, it doesn't. So part of me thought, well, this is maybe a dynamically generated list. So if there's none, it doesn't appear in the search. But you see the orange bit means that there is uh, in a, a couple of institutes where there is software as a type, but just with zero records. So it's not, it's not dynamically populated. When we look at DSpace, DSpace has software um, by default out of the box as a type, but we see uh, the massive proportion of green there, about 70%. It uh, doesn't contain software as a type, but out of the box, if you just get a brand new solution, or uh, DSpace, a new instance of DSpace, it, doesn't, it does contain software. This indicates that it's been removed because it's in the default. And then uh, ePrints, as I said, doesn't contain software out of the box, but it's kind of the opposite of uh, DSpace there. We see the blue bit, about 10% of people have gone out of the way to add that. When we look at the other correlation of variables, to kind of whiz through this, there is no other correlation. There was nothing that kind of indicated there was any relationship. We had to reject that. So nothing to do with Russell Group membership. No, uh, nothing to do with the, there being an RSE group there, although proportionally twice as much um, in the yes than in the no contained software. So to summarize that half of it, 72% of institutional repositories in the UK do not contain software as defined output. 63% cannot allow a researcher to upload their software as a defined item. Some repositories appear to have deliberately removed software as default type, which suggests that it's an institutional policy. There's no correlation with any other features that we, we found. We, we couldn't find anything else that kind of is explanatory, just even the platform itself. And as an indication of this, so this is the uh, events open source. So this is the config file. All you have to do is add one line to this with the word software, and then you have software as a type. So it's not a technical problem. You add one word to a config file. It seems to be a policy problem. So the second half of this then that isn't the paper, but we're kind of working on it at the moment, it's work in progress. So we set about to see where is all the research, where is all the research software. We know it's not an institutional repository, so we're trying to find well, where is it? So where are uh, researchers keeping their software? So we did, there was a question previously there on Simon's talk just about gateway to research. So we took advantage of um, that data. So if you don't know, gateway to research is um, a, it's the recording of all claimed outputs from public grants. Um, if anyone's had the pain um, of uploading their stuff, the research fish, this is kind of what you do, but it gives really, really rich data. It's really kind of enabled to research and a really class API. So what we found is, so in academic institutional repositories, there were a total of 1,512 pieces of software. In GTR, uh, 7,232, nearly five times the amount. So there is software being claimed as output. People are claiming it as output. They're not putting it in institutional repositories. We looked at other um, uh, variables in this. So these are all kind of the headers and uh, the, um, the tab table that you get from the API in GTR. So we picked three of these, whether the software is open sourced, the year produced, so we can see a change over time. Then also the URL, which is kind of one of the things I spent a lot of time working on. So trigger warning, this is eye-wateringly bad. This is the software per funder per year. Uh, so we see the eight or nine research councils there, and you see the amount of software outputs um, by them, and it absolutely plummets um, after COVID. So to get kind of positives from this, you see kind of 
the origin of the RFE movement, I suppose, and there's a massive escalation there where it kind of peaks in 2020 and then absolutely falls off a cliff. Everyone, these are in the single figures, um, except for EPSRC, which is down around what, uh, 80 or 90, I think it is. When we look at open sourcing per year, um, the data set is, has a bit of a limitation either as yes or blank. So we have to take it as yes, it is open source, or we don't know. So it's either a no or missing. We can't say it's not open source. You see, again, it follows the same pattern. It absolutely drops off a cliff from 2020. And then we put those two things together. We see what's kind of quite a horrible picture in terms of the amount of software that's actually being uh, listed as an output. Um, if you were to try and glean some kind of positivity here, at least over this side of the graph, the percentage of software that's open sourced has uh, grown quite a lot. That's kind of really cautious at straws. So then we decided to analyze the URLs. So uh, one of the uh, table, uh, one of the columns in the table gives you a URL for the software. So we thought, well, let's actually see what this tells us about where the software is kept. Um, worryingly, uh, only 70% of the entries, the 7,232 entries had a URL. So the other 2,000, we don't know. We don't know where it is. It's not linked to anything. Um, we did two kind of analyses on this. So first of all, we generated a HTTP response for each URL because I'd started clicking on them and then a lot of them were kind of 404s. So I thought I'm going to do this manually and save myself some time here, but also to see a test for liveness. Um, and then second of all, we parsed the URLs for keyword matches. So we didn't do any web script or anything. We literally just text mined the URL for um, some keywords. This didn't work out quite as well as I'd hoped. So I had to manually search 3,000 of those to try and put them into categories. So at least now I can do this you know, every year. Um, it's, it'll be automated from then. So when we looked at the 5,169 URLs that are listed um, from software, um, about 4,000 of those were live. So these two numbers don't add up to the, the 5,000, obviously, because I've only listed the unavailable errors. Some of them didn't like uh, web scraping, for example, and were re rejecting me. So only 4,000 of those had an okay. Um, when we break these down um, and then look at the actual URLs uh, and try and mine these for words and then lump these in the kind of categories. So at the top, there's a public commercial code repo, I've called it. So that's like a GitHub, Bitbucket, et cetera. That's by far the, um, the most popular. You look at institutional, that's not institutional repositories. That's anything with .ac.uk in the URL. We're doing a kind of sub-analysis on that. It could be like the old traditional uh, you know, computer science professor that has their own uh, web page and they store all their stuff in that. And then software-specific website, which um, is, was fairly popular. It was kind of somebody had done a, a project page. We blend those two analyses together then. So we test the live URLs for the words um, in the URL itself. Then we find kind of roughly the same order, but the percentage obviously grows because the number um, drops. So anything with a, an OK response, a 200 response, um, and we break that down per word. We see again the public commercial code repo is by far the biggest institutional second, the software specific website third. When we break that down and then see per word um, in the public commercial code repo provider, we see GitHub is by far the biggest, 85, 86%. There's even Google Code there, which kind of shows legacy software. Um, but the others are kind of way far behind. So by far, GitHub is the most popular. So to summarize that, um, then we see a large majority of institutional repositories don't recognize soft software as a thing. So as a researcher, I cannot upload software and call it as a, a defined uh, legitimate output. There's no technical barrier for this. When we look at the top three um, institutional repository flavors, platforms, two of them have it by default. One of them has it, you just have to add a word and config file. That would solve 90% of it. There is no technical barrier for this. It seems to be institutional policy. This can impact on ref returns, what's concerning on its own. And I'd started this to try and find, well, does that impact ref? And I haven't got a very clear answer. What I can say is, so as I said, ref doesn't, uh, doesn't mandate that any non-textual output is stored um, in an institutional repository before it can be, um, uh, can be included in ref. But there are systematic procedures in place. For example, Queens uh, have PURE as their uh, research information system, and it states in their guidance, ref guidance, that there's a module within Pure that will manage this process. So by default, it has to be in Pure before it can be managed and therefore be part of the ref process. So if it's not in the institutional repository, it can't be considered for ref. So if you can't upload it to your institutional repository, can it be considered in ref? I don't have quite a clear answer to that. Software declared as output is five times the amount found in institutional repositories um, and software outputs have plummeted since COVID. This um, was very telling. I still haven't finished the analysis, 
um, overall publications dipped slightly, but are at kind of 20, uh, 2018 levels. Uh, have kind of started to come back up actually. So there is a dip for all output because everybody was affected by COVID, working from home, et cetera, but there was nowhere near the same drop off. Um, so it seems, and this is just the kind of back of a beer mat sort of analysis, that it seems that people were potentially, um, you know, going with the thing that got them the most credit, which was a paper and the other artifacts they didn't necessarily have time for. Again, that's just a, off the top of my head, beer mat analysis, but there's been a, such a massive drop off compared to research outputs. Kind of shows the research is still being done. Of the 7,300 uh, software outputs, about 70% of you are listed, so we've lost information of 30%. Uh, just under 4,000 of these actually appear to work. So it could be, for example, if you've got project budget um, and you list your, uh, your domain hosting for you know, two years, whatever, and you've, that's expired, then that's disappeared and you don't have a URL for it anymore. Of these 4,000, the single largest um, source was commercial code repo that's where most software is being research software is being stored and the overwhelming majority of the provider was github so when you kind of add that all together to still it github stores about a third of working disclosed urls of software from publicly funded uk research that's probably quite an intuitive finding people would have thought that in advance but that kind of doesn't sit easy um when you compare this to kind of funder requirements or recommendations so we look at just rdm toolkit it says computer code should have a URL or DOI. We see 30% of uh, outputs in that are software don't have a URL. Um, and you should share your computer code like you would any other research output. But if you can't put it in your institutional repository, are you really doing that? The UK RA Concordat um, lists uh, quite nicely, quite kind of broad range of repositories where it kind of it thinks it's kind of like um, reasonable and would count as being pub publicly accessible. But if you're not putting it in a repository at all, or you don't know where the repository is, can you say you're actually doing that? And then the Budapest Open Access Initiative from 2002, and then the 20 year kind of restatement of it. So um, they make a very kind of specific um, uh, recommendation that it should be on open infrastructure. You should not rely on commercial code repos uh, for storing software because they're not guaranteed to be there tomorrow. There could be access requirements. You can see what happened with Twitter, et cetera. Um, you can see what could potentially go wrong with that. So as a kind of bold statement, um, we're not meeting those requirements uh, currently. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm just going to bring up the uh, slide out again. And we have some questions. I've been keeping an eye on these. And I think it's fair to say a few of them are quite similar questions. So I'll give you a call on whether you answer them secondly or just say it's the same thing. Okay. So let's start with the first question. After COVID, was there a similar reduction in non-software outputs? Is software a declining percentage of outputs? I'm currently breaking that down per category. <clears throat> so I gave an overall kind of figure because I haven't got it completed yet. So I don't want to give a, a an incorrect or incomplete analysis. We are currently working at the moment because it's working work in progress. What I can say is that overall publications did drop off slightly, but it was about 17, 18%. That's not an exact figure, um, but you see the massive plummet in, in overall software. It didn't have the same effect, which would lead you to believe that it's less of a priority. It's an artifact of the research, potentially. But again, that's we can't prove that. Thank you. The next question we have is along similar lines, I think. Isn't that fall off just production lag? There's always less published last year than the year before because these things take time to come out. Uh, if that's asking what to think about, it's asking, so you see the drop from 2000 or 2020 to 2021 when obviously it kind of works. So there is publication lag. So you'll see why 2021, it kind of really dropped off, but the top figure was 2020. Um, so yeah, it is, it is publication lag. So you see going forward that the, the publications would continue to drop then, but it's, it, it's still fewer things being outputted. So although. Although that might be spread over a couple of years, you, you still see it as, as fewer outputs. Thank you. If listing software is a new thing, are we seeing an early boost of academics submitting all software they've ever written, then a drop to the real production rate? Not that academics would ever do that. Um, um, I don't know. I, I mean, it isn't a new thing. Simon, you'd said it was 2008 it started being included. Yeah, so it's not really a new thing. Um, and if anything, it's kind of maybe getting worse. Um, so I don't know, um, but you do see an increase. Um, I mean, that could be one of the answers. I would like to think it's kind of the influence of the RSC, go the RSC community. You see it really taken off from 2010 and peaking at kind of 2019 or so. Thank you. 
who would be making the decision to remove the software type from where that has been removed and how would we reach them? I, I made a fairly bold statement in the first edition of that paper that um, I maybe kind of took out in review. Um, so I may have said it was kind of academic snobbery um, and how to refine that phrase. Um, I don't know. Everybody who works in the university knows that lots of different parts of the university can do things in parallel and not talk to each other. So I'm not, you could foresee that it would be, you know, somebody in the kind of the data science part of the, or the kind of data part of the library just deciding this. It could be an overall institutional policy. It's it's unclear. We do, you don't actually know. So it could well be the case that whoever bought the solution and just went to the default configuration could be that somebody's just thinking that software is not a thing and it's an individual. There's no way of telling that, unfortunately. Thank you. So this next one, I think, is more of a statement, and you alluded to this a little bit towards the end. Most research software outputs will likely end up on GitHub and GitLab with crosslinks to Zenodo, and that should be taken into account. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm working on that at the moment. So trying to look at GitLab or GitHub and their integration with Zenodo, see if there is a cross-reference, and see if we can get a DOI from it, to see if it's kind of if it's at least in a code repository and an archival repository. But it always leads me back to the thing that, that you should treat software like a paper and then you should ask the question, yeah. would I treat? <laughs> What's that? Yeah. My that's, thing? Yes, that's an objection from the audience there for the remote participants. So that's a, a terrible thing to say. Okay. Um, so if you, if, you, if you treat um, your software like a paper, then it should be in the institutional repository. Um, so whether there's kind of some, what I'm trying to work on again in the future is some form of integration where you can have it as in your institutional repository so it's permanent then. And not only uses the Zenodo, for example, and again, it is a third party thing, but if you work as part of the university, it should be kept within the university, but also shared on the, on the outside. So it should be indexed. It should be indexed within the university, but then can also be stored in other places. Sorry? That's not how, how collaborative research works. You can't just keep it in your institution. No, sorry, I mean, it should be recorded in the university. Sorry, probably must be that. Well, but it can be on an individual's account. The individual leaves the university, for example. The, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But it should be. Yeah, absolutely. But is there, but is there any reason why not also include it in the institutional repository? It sounds like this is an area where we want further discussion after the session, probably. Yeah. I'm aware that. For people speaking in the audience, that won't be um, that won't be on stream easy to hear for people joining remotely. Uh, but it does sound like that's definitely something to pick up later. So I, I okay. suspect you'll sure. be available to talk about. Yeah, that absolutely, definitely. Yeah. And if we could do one or two, maybe more. Um, so the next question we have: How do we account for extensions to existing software? For example, Astro Pi, um, which is a, a big software existing software package. Contributions that might be a software output, but not an independent one that may not have their own listing. Um, so I, I, there is a category uh, within the analysis for um, kind of packages. So whether it's you know, an hour package or whatever. So if that's asking what I think it's asking, then if it's defined as its own kind of extension in a package, then yeah, it's, it's absolutely as good as that, yeah. Okay, and let's say the next one is the, the last one to give people some change over time between thoughts. So I think that's probably similar enough, so we'll, we'll skip that one. Not all research outputs can be open source. Some, actually quite a lot of it, is tied to intellectual property, which both academics and universities are keen to retain, for example, for monetization. Yep. According to that rule, not open source, not recognition, I suspect the question goes on, but I think we've got the key bit there. What, what, what do you think of that statement? Yeah, absolutely, and other universities, um... Queens, for example, are very kind of keen to try and uh, monetize or um, get IP. You can still, there are kind of ways of kind of balancing the two in what parts you, you can list. Um, you can list it as just as an index within an institutional repository. It doesn't have to store it. It can just be as, a, as an output of your research um, and doesn't have to be taken further than that. And it is always kind of a balance. And I guess it's for you to talk to your PI about or your research development team. Thank you. I think we'll call it there with the questions and we'll um, have our, our pause before we go on to the next speaker. Thank you again, Daniel. Okay.